The following program is a production of Pioneer Public Television. Welcome to the Minnesota 7th Congressional District Debate on Pioneer Public Television. Tonight we will have the incumbent Colin Peterson, a Democrat from Detroit Lakes, and Tori Westrom, the challenger from Elbow Lake. Welcome to Pioneer Public Television's Minnesota 7th Congressional District Debate. My name is Amy Dahl Wallers and I will be your moderator this evening. We will start out with opening remarks from both candidates. We will then move on to some prepared questions and then we will wrap up with closing remarks. Asking questions this evening are two members of the media from West Central Minnesota. We have Reed Anfinson, the editor publisher of the Swift County Monitor newspaper in Benson and J.P. Cola, News Director for KWLM Radio in Wilmer. Welcome, gentlemen. Tonight's candidates running for the U.S. House of Representative in Minnesota's 7th Congressional District are Colin Peterson and Tori Westrom. Welcome, Hi. gentlemen. Hi. We're now going to look at a map of this district so if you can see if this is your voting area. The 7th District includes all of western, uh, the western side of Minnesota, with the exception of the southern counties bordering Iowa. The largest city in the district is Moorhead. Some other cities in this district are Wilmer, Fergus Falls, Alexandria, and Marshall. The seventh is actually the largest congressional district in Minnesota. We will now start with the opening remarks from both of the candidates. Both candidates have 90 seconds to give the opening remarks. And the coin toss was won this evening by Representative Peterson. So welcome, Representative Peterson. You may give your opening remarks. Well, thank you. And I want to thank um, uh, Pioneer Public Television for hosting this debate. And uh, I want to thank uh, my constituents in the 7th District for honoring me with being able to serve them for the last 24 years. I'm known as somebody who works across the aisle and gets things done. And by uh, being able to be in office uh, for quite a period of time, I've moved to the top of the Agriculture Committee. And as chairman, and now as ranking member, I've been at the table writing the 2008 and 2014 Farm Bills. Uh, it's probably the premier accomplishment of this Congress, getting a Farm Bill done. It took a little longer than we uh, wanted. But in January, we passed a very good Farm Bill that not only covers farm uh, safety nets, which is what most people think about when they uh, think about the Farm Bill. Actually, there's a lot more to it. And we had a very good conservation title that expanded significantly the conservation parts of the uh, Farm Bill. Uh, rural development, uh, which has helped us build new hospitals and, and other kinds of facilities across this district. Uh, so the Farm Bill has been uh, a very important thing for this district. And now we're in the process of getting it implemented. And we're making good progress, but it's going to take a while. And um, that's one of the main reasons that I'm running for re-election, to make sure the Farm Bill gets implemented correctly, and the folks that are against it don't take it apart. In addition to that, we've uh, working together in this district, we've done a lot to build new airports, roads, VA uh, clinics, and uh, also critical access hospitals. Thank you. And next, I'd like to uh, welcome Senator Westrom to the program. And Senator, you may give your opening remarks. Thank you, Amy and Pioneer Television. My name is Tori Westrom. And as many of you know, I lost my eyesight at the, in a farm-related accident at the age of 14. Today, I serve in our state senate, run a small business in my hometown with my wife, and I am the proud father of three beautiful children. I believe our country is headed in the wrong direction. But you can't change the game if you don't change the players at the table. After 24 years in Washington, Congressman Peterson simply hasn't done enough to, <clears throat> to stand up to the big spenders in D.C. On his watch, we have seen the national debt skyrocket, Obamacare passed by Democrat leadership, the Keystone Pipeline still not built because of the Obama administration, and cap-and-trade legislation passed through the House with Congressman Peterson's support. The way they're doing business in D.C. doesn't work in our district, and I know we can do better. Here in Minnesota, we balance our budget. We believe in hard work and common sense, and we need someone to represent those Minnesota values in Washington. 
As your next congressman, I will dedicate the can-do attitude and perseverance that I've had my entire life to representing our Minnesota values in Washington. Thank you. We will now move on to the questions. Each, question, each candidate will have 60 seconds to answer a question, and there will be an opportunity for some limited rebuttal. Uh, the first question will be asked by J.P. Cola, and Representative Peterson will have the opportunity to answer first. So, J.P., you can start with your question. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Representative Peterson, uh, farmers are very concerned about the recent plunge in corn prices, and uh, land values also are anticipated to drop. Is there anything Washington can or should do to prevent a western Minnesota rural recession? Well, thank you, J.P., and, uh, you know, the new farm bill <clears throat> changed the way uh, we did the safety net. In the past, we had these direct payments that went out uh, no matter what the situation. Under the new farm bill, we're going to put a floor under prices, uh, and this is going to really pay off given what's happened with prices here in the last uh, uh, few months. Uh, so we have a new safety net. Uh, we have crop insurance, which has been the main safety net, but this new PLC and ARC that are currently in the process of being implemented are going to do a lot to put a floor underneath this uh, price decline that's happened here the last few months. Thank you, Representative Peterson. And Senator Westrom, you may give your answer. Well, the agriculture is a very important part of this district. I grew up on a dairy farm. I have an agriculture background. I have been a strong and ardent voice for farmers and the ag communities in the state capitol. And I will continue to be that strong voice in Congress. I would have supported this past year's ag bill and the farm bill. Uh, farmers with a safety net, but something that allows them to do what they want with their land and farm the way they want to farm and not have government tell them what they need to do. They can run their own business. But uh, JP, a couple of the things government also needs to do is get out of the way of farmers rein in this out-of-control Obama EPA and stop trying to redefine navigable waters and put subject farmers and landowners to more uh, federal water and EPA control, uh, build the Keystone Pipeline so we can get our rail cars back to hauling grain. We need things like that that the Obama administration the current situation isn't getting done. Thank you. And Senator Westrom, the next question will start with you, and this is being asked by Reed. Senator Westrom, <clears throat> in rural Minnesota, our, our challenge isn't so much job creation as it is worker creation. What can we do to resettle rural America to ensure the jobs that are available right now get filled? Well, Reed, that's a, that's a good question. And uh, one of the most valuable things we have in our communities is our students and our children. And uh, having jobs for them to come back to is so important. And so having a strong economy and a strong job environment, uh, one way you do that is get regulations, big government, out of the way and let, let these jobs be created. But we also have to have strong uh, educational opportunities and educational opportunities that are attainable and uh, accessible for students that want to further themselves in higher education and uh, take on that challenge. But then we need to make sure they have good paying jobs when they leave a college so they can pay back their student loans and uh, expenses that go along with it. But one thing I've heard as I've traveled to 38 counties in this district, a lot of manufacturing jobs, uh, high-tech jobs that, that we see in manufacturing, need to find more students coming out into those fields. And so we need to make sure our colleges and our uh, universities are putting out students that can fill those jobs right here in rural Minnesota. Thank you. Representative Peterson. Well, thank you for the question, Reed. Um, uh, this is something I hear a lot about, uh, one end of the district to the other. Probably the number one thing I hear is uh, we can't find enough qualified people to fill these jobs. That's a good problem to have. Uh, so, you know, what I've been working on the last few months is trying to help tie together the education system uh, at the um, vocational school level, also the uh, secondary school level, with the jobs that are available in the district. And there's making good progress with some of these places. In, in uh, Alexandria, <clears throat> their new high school, they have four academies that start in the ninth grade getting these folks uh, experience or uh, getting them to, to see the opportunities that are out there in the manufacturing community in the district. And then they're working together with the uh, vocational schools. And that's the kind of thing that has, needs to happen because folks are telling me that these kids have got to start seeing 
the opportunity is at nine, ninth grade instead of uh, waiting until they get uh, out of high school. So uh, we're working on it, and uh, we need to do more work to make sure it, it happens in the future. Thank you. Reed, would you like to ask another question, please, to Representative Peterson? Representative Peterson, last year Minnesota residents and farmers faced propane shortages. What can be done to ensure that we don't have propane shortages again this winter and fall? Well, a lot of, has already been done. I just came from uh, Westcon uh, Industries out here, uh, a co-op out uh, uh, east of town. And uh, them and, and a number of the other folks have doubled their storage from last year. And that's probably the main thing on the short term. Uh, that uh, needs to be done and was done. Uh, we also need to get these pipelines uh, working in the right direction so that we have the uh, access to the uh, product. But the last winter was a com uh, perfect storm. We had the coldest fall we've ever had, the coldest winter. Uh, we had uh, wet the crops that needed to be dried, and it kind of all came together at the wrong time, and so it was a serious situation. I think we're in much better shape uh, going into this winter but, um, you know, folks are working on this. I think we've made good progress, and uh, we need to continue to keep focused so we don't have a problem going out into the future. Senator Weston? Read the propane crisis uh, last year. Uh, we need to uh, be aware of. Uh, we need to make sure we've got storage. And I know uh, several uh, uh, companies around uh, this district and uh, the state are doing more to have more storage. But we need to have the Keystone Pipeline uh, built rather than blocked by Nancy Pelosi, President Obama, and we can't put people in charge like Nancy Pelosi that will block these common sense projects. Pipelines are a safe way to move oil, and we need to have that done so our rail cars can be uh, back in our area with the ability to haul grain, but also bring propane in for this winter's heating season, because we now rely on rail cars even more because the pipeline that goes through Benson, right in your home area there, Reed, uh, is now not moving propane anymore, and that just went off this past April. So this year could even be worse. We need to build common sense projects like this. We can't support leadership like Congressman Peterson does, Nancy Pelosi, who blocks these common sense projects like the Keystone Pipeline. Thank you. JP, we're back to you with a question for Senator Westrom. Uh, Senator Westrom, uh, we're taking a look now at the federal budget. Uh, entitlements such as Medicare, Social Security, and the federal portion of Medicaid are a large part of the federal budget. Are they part of a discussion on a balanced budget? Well, JP, I think uh, making sure we have those programs so they are going to be available 20 years from now is an important discussion to have. Uh, we know we have to rein in the out-of-control spending. Our national debt is now nearing $18 trillion. Congressman Peterson, since he went to office 24 years ago, was at $4 trillion. It's now up to $18 trillion uh, just 24 years later. That's the wrong direction. That's our children's future at stake. And so we have to have a big discussion on how we would balance the budget. But it has to be all in context of how do we preserve the current program so those enrolled and those near retirement are protected reasonable incremental changes that would be looked at in a bipartisan way that's the way you change it and that's what you have to do to address this problem or some of those programs will be bankrupt in 20 years and we can't just put our head in the sand thank you uh, thank Peterson. you JP for the question uh, you know you, you can't take any part of the budget off the table when you're trying to to uh, get the uh, budget uh, resolved and, and get it under control and um, part of how we got into the current problem was the fact that we couldn't get a bipartisan um, vote or um, effort on the Budget Control Act of 2011. The only committee that did their work in that particular situation was the Agriculture Committee. We produced a bill that cut our budget $24 billion. Our budget is an entitlement. If all the other committees would have done something similar, we'd have had a significant reduction in the budget deficit. Now, I've supported balanced budget amendments. I've voted for a number of them over the years. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get one all the way through the process. Uh, but we're going to have to look at, at all aspects of government. But in the case of Medicare, the, the expending has come down. Uh, Medicaid is, is not uh, going up as fast. And Social Security, we just need to take the cap off of wages, and that'll uh, extend Social Security for quite a while. Senator Weston, would you like a rebuttal? Thank you, Amy. 
Well, we talk about balancing a budget. You can't keep passing, raising the debt cap, or debt, the debt, national debt ceiling by a trillion dollars like Congressman Peterson did this past year and not hook it to a balanced budget. You, you've got to balance the budget at the same time as you're discussing raising the debt, debt ceiling because that's our children's future at stake. And so that would be something I would advocate for as well as a balanced budget amendment. We've got a balanced budget amendment here in Minnesota. Congress needs one too. Representative Peterson, would you like a rebuttal? Well, I mean, it, people need to understand that raising the debt ceiling is not an authorizing new spending. All it's doing is, is authorizing the payment of the spending that's already happened. And if you tied the um, budget uh, situation to the uh, debt ceiling, uh, you'd end up shutting down the government, which was exactly what they did a year ago when they, when they did that. So, you know, we'd all like to uh, not raise the debt ceiling, but we have to pay our bills. And if you didn't raise the debt ceiling, we'd end up defaulting on our debt, and that's not something we should be doing. JP, your next question, please, to Representative Peterson. All right, uh, Representative Peterson, uh, regarding national security, do you favor using ground troops against ISIS or ISIL if the current air campaign proves ineffective? No. <laughs> Succinct answer. <laughs> uh, Senator Westrom? Uh, JP, uh, I, I am not advocating for ground troops. Uh, I think uh, the bigger question here, though, is the failed leadership we've seen out of President Obama and this administration. Uh, it is too bad it took so long for the president to recognize the threat of ISIS, and it let them grow to the point they are today. And so uh, we need a commander-in-chief that recognizes these serious problems rather than continuing to see this pattern failed leadership out of President Obama and his administration, and that's why we need change in Washington. It's time to shake things up. Uh, we've got a president that should have implemented a travel ban, like I hear so many people around this district asking me why we don't do that and suggesting. I think that makes sense. Uh, some travel restrictions with this Ebola uh, crisis, just another pattern of failed leadership out of this president. Thank you. Reed, your next question, please, for Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom, uh, has the Affordable Care Act hurt or helped the residents of the 7th Congressional District? The Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare, I call now the Unaffordable Care Act. It's not working in this district. You travel around and farmers, small businesses, families continue to see skyrocketing premiums, loss of choice in their health care, and it's not delivering the promises that we were told by President Obama and Nancy Pelosi, uh, both people that Congressman Peterson supports, when they passed this legislation. It's not delivering what we were told it was. It needs to be repealed and fixed. We can keep the good parts of it. But you can't keep this in place and have our small businesses who keep telling me they're seeing 40, 50, 60 percent premium increases or more. Just last night, picking my kids up from Awana at church, one of the couples came and talked to me afterwards and said, we're seeing a $400 a year or a month increase in our premiums because of the Obamacare. That's not acceptable. We can do better. And they haven't fixed it in four years. It's time for a change. Representative Peterson? Well, I, I didn't vote for the Affordable Care Act. And one of the reasons I didn't vote for it is I actually read it. Well, I didn't read the whole thing. I got halfway through it, and I knew enough that uh, I was not going to support it. But there are parts of this act that are good and have helped my constituents. And that's why I have not been willing to repeal it. Uh, for example, people, uh, I don't know how many times people have come to my office with young children that couldn't get coverage. And they weren't asking for government help. They were just asking for help so they could buy insurance for their families because their kids had juvenile diabetes or some other pre-existing condition that precluded them from having coverage. Uh, if we repealed it, we, we'd lose that. Also, the 26-year-old on their policies, uh, having a, getting rid of the lifetime limits on health care, those are positive things. What we need to do now is we need to work on the part of the bill that's not working. And, you know, there's too much of that bill was written for the insurance companies and for the drug companies. And that's exactly the wrong thing to do, and that was the main reason I voted against it. And we didn't fix the Medicare disparity situation that's been going on for years. 
And when you oh. spend a trillion dollars and can't fix that, you know, there's something wrong. Senator Westrom, would you like a rebuttal? Uh, thank you, Amy. You know, the vote to pass the Obamacare was four years ago. Since then, Congressman Peterson continues to vote to keep this the law of the land. That's what happens after 24 years. He has now said he won't work to repeal it in local newspapers. And that's the wrong direction. We can't give up. Our families, our farmers, our small businesses, the lady that just talked to me last night, they need to have more hope that we can take the good things, rewrite it into a bill that will work for the families and deliver what was promised by President Obama and Nancy Pelosi, who Congressman Peterson continues to support and enables to allow this to happen. Thank you, Representative well, Peterson. The first two years that this bill was in, enacted, well, they didn't even try to repeal it. Then they tried to repeal it 51 times. Uh, you know, and it's not getting any place. The Senate was not going to take it up. The president's not going to sign a bill to repeal his law. And he's going to be president for the next two years. So I've told the leadership, I've told John Boehner, who's a friend of mine, you know, I can deliver 60 Democrats to fix the problems that we have with this bill and fix the problems that Senator Westrom is talking about. But they don't want to do that because it's all political. It's all, all or nothing. So the Democrats want to keep everything and say that nothing is wrong. The Republicans want to repeal everything. The reality is both of them are wrong. And what needs to be done, we need to go to the middle Thank and you. work on the things that are a problem. Time is up. All right, JP, you can ask your next question, please, to Representative Peterson. Okay, Representative Peterson, and we, we kind of touched on this a little bit uh, earlier in one of the answers that um, Senator Westrom gave. Uh, hospitals, clinics, and public health services throughout the district are preparing for an Ebola case. What should the federal government's role be in helping them? Well, we should make sure uh, from a federal level that the folks that um, are going to be the ones on the front lines have the resources that they need and the training that they need to deal with this. And I think, um, you know, uh, we've done a pretty good job of identifying where the problem is going to come from and where it's going to enter. And so there are now travel restrictions on five airports where the majority, 95 percent of these folks would come in if they come into the country. Uh, we've also asked here in Minnesota to have them uh, add Minneapolis because we do get folks from that part of the world coming into Minneapolis. I think they should be added and the resources should be given to these folks that are going to have to deal with us on the, uh, that level. So you know, we should work with the community, with the health community, to make sure they have the resources, have the training that they need so they can confront this. Thank you. Senator Westrom? Thank you, Amy. Uh, JP, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we should have had better leadership out of our president and the current administration. Our communities need to have confidence in what the government uh, is, is uh, offering them for help is competent, up-to-date information, which has been a big concern we found out now with the Texas situation. Like I said, we should have travel restrictions. We should have a president that would recognize this and do it right away. Uh, the current travel restrictions should be increased. Uh, that's the kind of common sense I hear out of the voters in this district, and that makes sense, and I wish our president would show some leadership rather than, than what we've seen. Thank you. Reed, you may ask your next question to Senator Westrom. Senator Westrom, uh, sometime yet this year, Governor Dayton plans to call a pheasant summit. Look at the fine pheasant population. Is the federal government doing enough for habitat creation and sustaining the habitat that's out there? Reed, uh, I think the pheasant population has uh, certainly increased since I was uh, uh, a youngster. Uh, since most of us, uh, th there weren't very many pheasants uh, 20, 30 years ago. So I think there's been a good mix uh, caught. Uh, one of the things you have to balance is not to have government programs uh, incenting to take good uh, product productive farmland out of production. And that takes sometimes uh, land off the tax rolls or reduces the taxes that are paid on it and uh, reduces the production that we see. But rather, it should be focused on uh, environmental areas, sensitive areas along rivers and streams and lakes. And as a congressman, I would work for that kind of common sense solution. And I think uh, those balances have been met uh, pretty well lately. Thank you. Representative Peterson? Well, the Conservation Reserve Program, which I would uh, say is mo responsible for bringing back pheasants and ducks and deer, is something that I've worked on in my entire career. I was the one that got the acreage up to 36 million acres when we did the uh, 96 bill. 
But what's happened here the last few years is the, as the price of uh, land rental has gone up and the price of land has gone up, you've seen people t coming out of the Conservation Reserve Program uh, because of economics. And we weren't paying enough in the CRP to compete with that. Uh, so we've had to lower the cap, which at one time was $36 million. Uh, in the 2008 bill, it was cut to $32 million. And now, uh, in this last bill, we reduced it to $24 million. And the reason we did that is we we're going to end up at that level anyway. And if we wouldn't have done that, the money would have just disappeared. So we used that to create the new Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which is going to be a big uh, advantage for the Red River Valley and the Minnesota River Valley uh, going forward in, in uh, controlling floods and other kinds of problems. So uh, uh, I think we've done about as much as we can. All right. Thank you, gentlemen. That's actually all the time that we have for questions this evening. We'll now move into the closing remarks, and we will begin with Senator Westrom. Senator? Uh, thank you, Amy and uh, Pioneer Television. When I was 14, lying in a hospital bed, just after the doctors had told me I would likely never see again, I could have never imagined that one day I would be here, running for the privilege to serve my community in Congress. I was fortunate. I had parents and others who wouldn't let me give up. And by the following summer, I was right back at work, bailing hay on our family farm. That experience has taught me two things. First, <clears throat> there is never a time to make excuses. And second, there is always a way to get things done. Like most Minnesotans, I am tired of hearing the excuses we see here out of Washington. Our children's future depends upon reigning in the out-of-control spending, repealing and fixing Obamacare, and stopping the big government overreach. Even I can see the mess in Washington. My name is Tory Westrom. I am ready to take on the challenge, and I am asking for your vote on November 4th. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Senator. And now, Representative Peterson, you may give your closing remarks. Well, I want to thank <clears throat> Pioneer Public Television for doing this debate. And I want to tell a story at the end here to kind of uh, illuminate uh, what experience can do. Back in 2003, a fellow named Bill Thomas, who's a Republican from California, was a chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. And he was going to do a Medicare improvement bill, which uh, had drug coverage and so forth. But he couldn't get any Democrats to support him because they opposed some of the things in his bill, didn't think he was doing enough uh, in, in their regard. <clears throat> I was working on rural hospitals at the time, critical access hospitals, which at the time had a 15-bed limit. So Bill came to me, we had become friends, and he said, will you work with me? I said, yes, if you'll do something with the critical access hospitals. So we worked on the bill, we brought it to the floor, and in that bill we raised the beds to 25 and the reimbursement to 101%. The problem was we didn't have enough votes. So they held the vote up for three hours on the floor. I got a lot of heat from my leadership uh, to switch my vote. But at the end of the day, we got the bill done. And without that critical access hospital provision that reimburses it 101 uh, percent, many of my 39 critical access hospitals would not be here. The hospital in Appleton or in Benson may not be here if we didn't, wouldn't have done that in 2003. The point is, we have seven Democrats vote for that bill, 19 Republicans vote against it, and it passed by one vote. And the reason it did is because I saw an opportunity and I went and made it happen. That's the kind of thing we need happening in Washington, not only on hospitals, but on farm bills and other things. And I'll keep doing that and ask for your vote on November 4th. Thank you, gentlemen. That's all the time we have for this evening's debate. I'd like to thank the candidates for joining us. I'd like to thank JP and Reed as well. But most importantly, I'd like to thank you, the viewer, for tuning in. Remember, your voice is important. Make sure your voice is heard by voting on November 4th. Good night.